Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. Um, and the network is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us today Nick Weiner from Octo, um, my colleague who's going to be telling us about Markive. And we're so excited for many reasons, uh, but the, 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 in, the new launch of Markive. And, um, to tell you all about it as well as this hosting on Zoom for the first time. And also we have Ray Evrard who is a new uh, Octo employee and we're welcoming her as also a co-moderator. Um, so I wanted to let you guys know um, how to ask questions. So you can see there is a Q&A panel, uh, a little bit different than our old webinars, but Q&A panel, it also sends questions to us. Um, uh, Zoom also has the option for chats and you can chat with individuals and the whole group. We would ask that you be only use this in a very professional capacity. If you did have information you wanted to share with the group relevant to Markive, um, feel free to share it with the group. Um, uh, or and you could target individuals for chats, but please keep it confined to the subject matter at hand um, and uh, Using professional courtesy so and then if you want to send in questions to be answered by Nick about Markive uh, Use the Q&A. Okay uh, Nick, I'm gonna sing, s turn it over to you now Yes, hello everyone. Hi, this is Nick Weiner, and I'm the director of open initiatives at Octo and Thank you all for joining us today uh, so I'm going to talk to you about making your research freely available with Markive, the brand new research repository for ocean conservation and climate change related science, which is launching officially today. Very excited. Um, so let me, oops, here we go. So Markive, as we keep saying, it rhymes with Archive, and it's the research repository for basically all things related to ocean conservation and climate change research. Uh, so the repository itself is hosted on the Open Science Framework. So you can get to that at osf.io slash preprints slash Markive. And the documentation and uh, much of the other information we'll be sharing with you today is available on the markive.org website. Uh, so that there is a screenshot of the Markive repository where you can find all the papers. Uh, so the Markive team at Octo, um, consists of Sarah Carr, who is introducing this webinar, and Ray Edward, who is our project manager, um, also me, uh, Allie Brown, and John Davis. And then our advisory board, which is still growing, uh, has all the lovely individuals you see here. Uh, they've been uh, instrumental in helping us get Markive put together and advising us on the way forward. So we're very, very thankful to everybody on the advisory board for helping us out. Uh, so first and foremost, we are granting out money to solicit Markhive ambassadors to help us spread the word on Markhive and help people get their research into Markhive. So this is a great thing to share with your networks. Uh, the link right there is oct.co slash Markhive ambassador. Uh, so for the first year of Markhive, um, we are going to be awarding 10 uh, Markhive ambassadors with a thousand US dollars each as basically a thank you for helping us spread the word on Markhive. Uh, the ambassadors will serve a one-year tenure beginning January 1st, 2018. We're looking specifically at graduate students, postdocs, early career researchers, and professionals. Um, the idea is basically that you will help shepherd your affiliated institution to archive their research in Markhive. I love saying archive and archive in the same sentence. Um, so therefore, your affiliated institution should be open-minded about sharing research publicly. Um, preference will be given to ambassadors based on our focal geographies of Chile, China, Japan, Indonesia, Mexico, and the US. And applications are due by December 17. Basically, all you have to do is fill out a short little Google form just telling us about yourself and then uh, submit two letters of support from uh, senior faculty members or senior researchers at your institution. Uh, basically just saying like, yeah, you know, we like sharing research publicly and we think that our research should be available to people that don't have institutional subscriptions to data sets. Uh, so with that, you know, be sure to apply. It's a great opportunity. We think it'll be really instrumental in helping everybody get their research in Markive. Um, so, First off, what should you kind of be sharing in Markhive? So Markhive is basically a repository for all different types of research. Uh, we don't think that 
preprints alone are enough to help ocean conservation. So we're looking at preprints and postprints, and we'll get into what those are in a second here. Um, we are looking at open access papers, reports and white papers, posters, abstracts, conference proceedings, data sets, basically any kind of academic scholarly output you can think of. Um, we'd also really like to see papers that you wouldn't normally see published in traditional journals, like negative results. Uh, every conference we've gone to talking about Markhive and, and open science, uh, we hear from managers and planners all the time about how they need to see papers on what doesn't work. So we're really putting a push out here for negative results and other things that journals like tend to say isn't worthy of being published. Uh, so, oh, sorry. No, okay. Um, so next thing, are preprints new? Preprints are not at all new. So preprints have been around since at least 1991. Uh, there's 1 1.3 million articles in uh, Harvard's archive alone, and that's growing at about 8,000 submissions per month. I can see this really awesome graph here from PrePubMed uh, that shows you the growth of BioArchive just since that got started in, around uh, late 2013. And there is just so much research coming out there. Um, however, preprints are new to the ocean sciences and climate change sciences. Uh, so this is just looking at the discipline of environmental sciences. And you can see that like, you know, in, in 2017, we had maybe 20 or 30 preprints for the entire year. Uh, if we look at aquaculture, fisheries, and fish science specifically, it's even worse. Uh, you can see here the graph, like that's six papers being added right there in that month. And the same thing with marine biology, not so much better. You know, we're like right in like the five to 10 mark here. So we have a lot of room to grow. Um, so mark height is needed because those who can benefit from the science cannot access it. So we know that 99% of the world's population does not have subscription access to academic journals. People are not largely supported by universities that are paying for subscriptions to these things. Uh, we know that on the ground conservation efforts are largely performed by those without access to the subscription research. And most governments and government agencies don't have subscriptions to these academic journals either. Uh, we know that's the case here in our home state. And uh, you know, if we want people to trust the science that we're telling people to use, they need to be able to read more than just the abstract. And uh, we know specifically that for marine protected area management plans, only 14% of the information cited within many of those actually cited scientific literature. And that was, of course, mainly due to paywalls because those that were writing the NPA management plans did not have subscription access to academic journals or to databases like Scopus or Web of Science to be able to find that research. So we know that Markive can help people by getting this research out there for free. And of course, subscriptions are really, really expensive, even if you're at universities that have them. Uh, so in 2009 alone, tier one universities paid on average $1.2 million a year each <laughs> to Elsevier alone. <laughs> so that's just one publisher. Uh, and we tried to get a subscription to Marine Pollution Bulletin once just for two employees, and this is like back in 2010, uh, and that would cost us $10,000 per year. So you know, $5,000 per employee per year, you can see how this scales up to reach an average of 1.2 million a year just to one publisher. And uh, furthermore, then just from the, the cost issue, is that publishers love to restrict where preprints and postprints can be shared because obviously having research freely available is a detriment to their business model. So many publishers restrict sharing uh, research papers in for profit general repositories. So things like ResearchGate and Academia.edu are almost always prohibited from being shared in, uh, which of course is why we keep hearing in the news that so many thousands and millions of papers are being dropped from ResearchGate now uh, because of copyright violations. Uh, furthermore, Markhive not only is not for profit, we're also a subject matter specific repository, which is another loophole that publishers put in there just to make sure that research can't be shared in, in general repositories. So we are around because we need to be a nonprofit subject matter specific repository to make sure we can get all the different types of research out there. And uh, we also know that you can't really email an author for a free copy. That's just not really something that works that well. So we've surveyed a bunch of our users and the typical response rate from the author is around 50%. Uh, you also have to have a lot of assumptions made for emailing the author to work. 
you have to assume that the author is still alive, which a lot of the times they might not be, depending on how old the research is. You have to assume that the email address is correct and that the author is still in the same institution they were when they performed the work. You have to ensure that your email actually reaches the author, that's not going to send spam mail somewhere. You have to make sure that you're both comfortable conversing in the same language and that the author actually responds to the request in a timely fashion. So yeah, it's a lot, a lot to assume and a lot to all happen at the same time in order to actually get a paper from an author. And uh, beyond that, we know that many people do not email authors for papers. This is not something they're interested in doing. Uh, we know that from the 1% of people that actually have access, subscription access to academic journals, so they don't have to pay for anything. We know that like the average review paper is downloaded 500 times in the first year. An excellent review paper is downloaded on average 1,200 times in the first year. And we know from talking to people that no one is getting that many emails. I mean, you would expect, you know, 1,200 downloads times the 99% that don't have access. You would expect that number to balloon. Nobody's getting emails like that. So what is a preprint? A preprint is the manuscript that you submit to a scholarly journal to undergo peer review before it's formally published. Uh, so in some journals, this is colloquially known as an accepted manuscript. Uh, and generally speaking, it's easiest to ob abide by copyright law uh, and the, the copyright transfer agreements that you typically sign with traditional journals if you publish your manuscript and archive before you submit it for publication in a journal. So a lot of journals, when you're publishing with them, they want to know if you've put a preprint out there uh, so they can watch that for the kind of comments that are going on to initiate those comments into the peer review process. Uh, I'm sure as you know that in uh, peer review for academic journals, finding peer reviewers is often really difficult. So when the publishers can see who's commenting on a paper and who's talking about the paper, they can therefore find out people to ask to review the paper. Uh, so while Markive does not yet have public commenting on papers, it will soon, and we'll get into that. And then a postprint is the edited and peer-reviewed, but not yet typeset version of a manuscript. So you can see another example here. Um, you, you see uh, in a lot of journals that postprints are known as a corrected proof. So again, I'm just going to backtrack here real quick. So preprint. This is the manuscript that you submit to the journal. Generally speaking, it's got page numbers. It's got all the you know, tables and um, all that kind of stuff, like in appendices at the end. And then the postprint is the one that has all the crazy formatting from the journal. Um, it'll usually say correct to proof or have some kind of watermark on it. Um, and it's the one that you're supposed to check over to make sure it's actually fine before they actually publish it. Um, now, there are restrictions, of course, from most journals in which ones of these you can share and when you can post them. Uh, so most publishers have an embargo period on sharing the postprint publicly, uh, but most allow you to share the preprint right away, and we'll get into that in a minute. So how do you know if you can share your paper in Archive? So again, best practice, upload your preprint before you submit it to a journal. Uh, that way, when you're submitting to a journal, you can give them the DOI and tell them exactly where the preprint is. And if you've already uh, published in a journal, you will almost always have to sign a copyright transfer agreement or a CTA that gives the publisher the rights to publish your work. And most of the time, you are transferring almost all of your copyright over to the publisher, uh, in which case, one of the things you can do is utilize this uh, framework called the Scholar's Copyright Addendum. And the Scholar's Copyright Addendum is part of the Science Commons, and it exists to help you generate, you know, boiler text legalese to give yourself additional rights that would normally be transferred to the publisher. Uh, so what most people don't realize is that the whole copyright transfer agreement is meant to be a bargaining process. Uh, that is not supposed to be something that you just, you know, sign because the publisher tells you to sign it. Uh, that is when you're supposed to tell them, you know, like what rights that you think that you need to have before you give those to the publisher. Uh, so the scholar's copyright addendum, you can use that to make sure that you're granted immediate access or access reuse rights, which will let you share your paper more broadly. Um, so in good news and sharing preprints, Elsevier, Springer, 
Wiley, Taylor, and Francis, all allow to be preprints to be shared immediately in Markive. Uh, Postprints, as I said, are normally subject to an embargo period. So for Elsevier, there's usually a two-year embargo across the board on postprints. Uh, Springer and Wiley, it's generally considered a one-year embargo. And Taylor and Francis, it's a 1.5-year embargo. And we've collected a bunch of these embargo periods on the markhive.org website for all the documentation, such as markhive.org slash policies. Again, your copyright transfer agreement will have, uh, it, it might differ from what the traditional policy is for the publisher or for the journal. So that always reigns supreme. So always check your copyright transfer agreement for any kind of exceptions. And uh, again, if you're publishing, if you've published your work open access, you can share that anywhere. So you can take any kind of open access publication and share it in Markhive at any point in time. Uh, so citations for Markhive preprints are handled very nicely. Uh, so Google Scholar, for example, treats preprints, postprints, all these different uh, ways that you'd have your paper as different versions. So you'll notice uh, this is one paper that was just added to Markhive. And you see that it has this all nine versions mark down here. And uh, if you click on that, it'll tell you like all the different places it is. Uh, and it normally takes Google Scholar about uh, three to 30 days to index preprints uh, from the OSF framework. So within about a month, you should have the preprint showing up in uh, Google Scholar. And you know that'll give people a direct link to download the PDF right there for free. Uh, so when you're adding a peer-reviewed, already published document in Markhive, there is an option to put in the DOI for the version of record. And that's publisher speak for the final version that the journal has published. Uh, so when you link the DOI there for the version of record, the DOI for the preprint is then associated with the DOI for that version of record. That metadata is all compiled together so that Google Scholar and other services can make sure that a citation on your preprint or your postprint or your final version of record are all considered the same thing. So if people cite your preprint, that's going to be automatically handled for you, so you'll automatically get citation data for that. So what happens after you submit your paper? So your paper is immediately publicly accessible by everyone and anyone in Markhive. We utilize a post-moderation process. So we go in after the fact and just make sure that your paper meets all our guidelines. Um, if it doesn't meet our guidelines, we'll reject it and it'll be uh, made private so that only you can access it as the authors. And then uh, if there are like specific issues we had with it that we just need you to fix, be able to, you'll be able to fix those issues and then just resubmit. Uh, you like, literally, you can just click a button right after you fix whatever issues we had and then it'll go right back into our queue. Um, so things that we're generally looking for is just making sure that, you know, you, you have the correct information in there. We don't want anybody sharing anything illegally to the best of our knowledge. We don't want any spam or unrelated papers or obvious examples of academic misconduct or anything like that. Uh, not that we expect any of this to happen, uh, from the history of preprints and other journals, <laughs> like this very, very, very rarely happens. Uh, you know, occasionally you get like a spam paper every now and then, but no one's ever had anything that was, you know, a blatant example of academic misconduct or anything like that, thank God. Um, so after your paper is indexed or is added to Markhive, we as the Octo team are going to help promote and summarize your work. Uh, so we are going to integrate preprints into the Open Channels Literature Library, which serves roughly 85,000 practitioners a year. Uh, we are also going to share the papers in the Open Channels Literature Updates and Weekly Updates, which go out to about 6,000 subscribers each or um, total. Uh, we are going to be sharing papers from our Twitter account at Markhive Papers and at Open Octo. Uh, we're also going to match make your paper with researchers in our community that we know can benefit from it. Furthermore, we are going to be summarizing about three papers a week for a manager and policymaker audience. So we are going to really do everything we can to make sure that your papers are actually used for real ocean and climate change management and policy making. Uh, we're also going to discuss and summarize papers on an upcoming podcast we're launching next year. So again, like not only does your paper, when you add it, 
in Markive, you know, it gets a DOI if it doesn't already have one, it becomes freely available to the 99% of people on the planet that don't normally have access to these things. We're also gonna make sure that it gets into the hands of people that need it as best we can. Uh, and beyond that, we know that preprints, generally speaking, get papers more citations. So on average, if you look at all the different academic disciplines, uh, papers available with a preprint get 30% more citations. Uh, in the Open Channels Literature Library, we also see a 70% increased readership of people reading freely available papers than we do ones that are paywalled. Uh, again, as we said, we're going to be summarizing papers. So we're going to be giving you all kinds of uh, publication and promotion of your research for sharing it. You get free DOIs. So if you have a report or a white paper or a thesis or some other kind of document that doesn't have a DOI, you can share that in archive and we'll give you one. Uh, we for Open Channels actually um, published a paper last year and um, we didn't have a DOI for that. So we popped it in archive last week and it now has a DOI. Uh, so it's a great example of how you can get free DOIs for papers like that. Uh, so the Markive preprints is built into the Open Science Foundation's uh, preprints framework, which utilizes the SHARE partnership. So the SHARE partnership aggregates data from a whole bunch of open access repositories. So if you're on the OSF preprints framework, you can search papers from Archive, BioArchive, PeerJ, and a host of other open access and uh, freely available archives. Uh, all the projects are indexed by Google Scholar and Altmetric. And coming soon, everybody will be able to see Altmetric Donuts, uh, which, you know, those handy little rainbow colored charts that show uh, how your paper is performing in the media and other places. And also post-publication peer review uh, via public commenting will be coming soon. So we're really excited about that. Um, again, like just so many, so many good reasons for sharing your paper in archive. Uh, so, how do you actually share your work in Markive? I'm going to give you a demo of this in a second, but this is just a handy little breakdown. And the, uh, again, this webinar, we're, we're recording it, and we already have this PDF shared at markhive.org slash events slash archive. Uh, so you can go there and, and download this, and you can have all this together. And all these steps are also outlined, again, on the markhive.org website. Uh, we have a lot of documentation to help you get through all this. But um, to be quick about it, um, you can just visit the Markive repository at osf.io slash preprint slash Markive. And all you have to do is click the Add a Paper button. Uh, so you're going to log in with your OSF preprints account if you already have one. Uh, it's free, and they're really quick to do. Uh, if you don't have one and you have an ORC ID, you can sign in with that and automatically start linking your ORC ID information over to help uh, take care of your uh, automatic citation handling. Uh, so the first thing you do after you log in then is you're just going to go to the upload section. You're going to upload the PDF of your paper and you're going to give a title. Uh, after you give the paper a title and you click save, then it actually does the upload. Uh, then you're going to select the disciplines or subdisciplines that best categorizes your work. Um, if your subdiscipline is missing, uh, just let us know and we can work on getting that in there. Uh, we're using the, the press taxonomy. Uh, so these things are, are standardized across a whole bunch of different academic disciplines. Um, you'll notice that in many places there is no ocean conservation or just like, you know, climate change discipline. It's because the press doesn't recognize those academic disciplines yet. Uh, so we're kind of doing the best to get in there the official way by using the disciplines that already exist in the taxonomy. Uh, so after you select the disciplines, you're going to select a license for your work. If you have a DOI already, you're going to pop that in there to make sure that the metadata is all linked up. You're just going to pop in your abstract and write any keywords to make your work more easily discoverable. discoverable. Uh, so you can just type those in or you can just copy and paste them from the uh, peer review document if you already have that. Uh, you're going to add in the authors to your work. If those authors don't have OSF accounts, you can add in their name and their email address and they'll be invited to create an account. And with those accounts, you can give the other authors um, edit access to the preprint if you'd like, should they need to change their email addresses in the future, or if there's a new version of the paper, um, if, there, you know, if there's a typo in your abstract or something like that, then your co-authors can take care of that as well. And then all you do is click Submit at the end of that, and your work is actually available on Markive. So I am going to share my screen here for a second. I'm going to show you how 
can do that. Bear with me in one second as I switch shares here. Okay, Sarah, can you see my uh, yep. Safari? Yep, yep, we Sweet. can. Okay, so I'm already logged in with my OSF account. So I am going to um, just proceed with clicking out a paper. So you'll notice I don't have to log in because um, I already have an account. Otherwise, you would just take care of that here. So, you know, we're going to upload a new paper. And I am just going to upload this issue oops, of MPA News for the test. If I can grab it in here. There we go. And I'm just going to say this is a test MPA News publication. And you'll notice now that after I click Save and Continue that the upload takes place. All right, so you can see here the upload section is already completed. So the paper file, you can see that that's labeled as version one, and I've titled it Test NPA News Publication, just to make sure I know how to delete this in the future. So the next step is adding a discipline. So I'm going to say that this is under the Social and Behavioral Sciences and Environmental Studies, primarily. Um, I might also say it's under Life Sciences and Marine Biology. So I'm going to click Save and Continue there. You'll notice that all those disciplines are right up there at the top. And at any point, you know, you can click this thing to edit and go back. Uh, and continue. Uh, so then I'm going to choose a license. Now, by default, we go by the Creative Commons uh, Attribution 4.0 International License. Um, there are other examples here. Uh, for example, you would choose no license if you want to hold all the copyright yourself, uh, which we don't recommend because we think that sharing the paper is vital to Markive. Um, you can also choose other if your work is already licensed on the document itself. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to say um, the Creative Commons default license. I would like to apply that license to an OSF project, which means that when you create a preprint in Markive, you also get an OSF project created for that preprint. So you can upload additional data, supplementary materials, appendices, uh, other things like that to your OSF project. So for example, if you have a, a peer reviewed publication that you know, has like extra map data and stuff with it, you can upload all that GIS information to the OSF project and make that publicly available as well. So if I had a peer reviewed publication DOI, so a DOI on the like quote unquote version of record, I would pop that DOI in here. Um, for this paper, we don't have a DOI, so we're not gonna put one in there yet. Uh, for keywords, I might say this is marine protected area. I might say it's IUU fishing. And I'm just having between these to make new ones. Um, I might also say that this is like, I don't know, uh, ocean optimism. So uh, then I would also uh, probably just copy and paste the abstract on here. So I'm going to say this is my awesome abstract. And I'm going to click Save and Continue to move on to the authors. So you'll see that I'm already given um, the primary authorship here since I'm logged into the account. Um, you'll notice this little thing here for citation. So when you add more authors, you can determine if you want those authors to be included in the citation or not. So if you have an administrator at your institution that you want to be able to have edit access to these documents, you can add them in and then just uncheck the citation that way they'll have edit access to the project, but they won't be counted in the citation information for the preprint itself, which is really handy. Um, so I'm just gonna say that John Davis is an author on this paper. I'm gonna search for him. And it says that John does not have an OSF account. So I'm gonna add him by his email address. So I will type in his name here and then his email address. So John will be identified or will be emailed by OSF to tell him that this preprint has been made available. Um, so let's say in this case, John is the only author of MPA News, and I'm not. Um, I would like to be an administrator on this project. So I'm going to uncheck myself on citation. And I can decide then if John should be, he should be an administrator on the project as well. He should have read and write access, meaning that he can edit the document, or if he should be able to just view the document. 
Uh, so I'm going to make John have read and write access by default, and I'll just leave that there. Now, that's all you need to do. You just add in the authors, and you can re rearrange the authorship too, depending on the order that you would like to have them cited. Um, so then all you have to do is hit Create Paper, and it's immediately publicly available on Markhive. Um, now, again, this is just a test, and I don't want this to be publicly available on Markhive, Markhive so I'm going to click Cancel here. But otherwise, it's real easy. So I'm just going to click Cancel, and I'm going to abandon this preprint. Oh, sounds really harsh. Um, so with that, I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint here real quick. Do, 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 do. OK, so to the demo. Now, as I said before, Markhive has a robust search feature involved because Markhive is built in the OSF preprints framework. We have a whole bunch of different repositories that are all indexed in the same place. So if you're on the Markhive papers website, you can just click the search button right there without even um, putting anything in, and it'll take you to the full list of everything that's there. And the handy thing you can do with that is utilize the subject areas on the left side to narrow down your browsing and your searching. So if you're just browsing for specific papers, you might just want to select like, OK, I'm specifically looking for papers on environmental law or ecology and evolutionary biology or you know, oceanography, sociology, things like that. Uh, it's really pretty handy. So I'm going to show you that real quick. By just switching back over again here. So we're on the OSF papers again. And you'll notice if I just click search here, I get right back to the. Sorry, let me uh, refresh this here. Ta da! Here we go. Um, so you'll see here over in the subject side that we can drill down and change where are these things all searching. And if you'd like to open up your search to every paper, not just those in Markhive, you can just go right up here to the active filters and click clear filters. Oops, sorry. Um, you can go back to the, uh, the share framework here, and you can search everything that's in the share framework. So let's just say I want to search ocean conservation. I can do that. And you'll start seeing all these different papers. And it'll tell you where these are all indexed, where they're coming from. So you'll notice that this paper here is a preprint coming from PeerJ. Uh, this one here is from Research Papers and Economics. This one's coming from Ag Econ Search and Research Papers and Economics as well. Uh, so these are coming from a host of different sites that are all indexed together. So I'm just going to go back here. Go back to Markive. There we go. Uh, and again, the um, oops. Uh, you can also get all this from the OSF preprints website. So just osf.io slash preprints. And you can search everything from a whole host of different research providers. Uh, so there are all these different preprint service providers. You can see a lot of them in action. You can search all those right from here at OSF preprints. And again, the documentation, the call from archive ambassadors, um, more information on how to submit your paper, common questions, including archiving policies that we've found from a whole bunch of different journals are all on here at markhive.org. So with that, okay. I will take any of your questions and I'll switch back here to my PowerPoint real quick just to put okay. up the contact information. All right, thanks so much, Nick. Um, and just to let everyone know, we'll use the rest of the time for question and answers. You can go ahead and type your questions into the question and answer panel, and we'll have Nick answer it. Uh, so there was an early question, and it was uh, someone who said, just curious why Canada is not included in the ambassador initiative. Oh, so it is included in the ambassador initiative. Um, so we're just giving preference to our focal geographies. So Markhive is funded by the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. And the foundation has six focal geographies for the Markhive project. Um, so those focal geographies are where we're, um, we want to make like a specific push to make sure that we have ambassadors in each of those focal geographies. So our preference is to make sure we have at least one ambassador in each of those focal geographies. 
Um, but I mean, it doesn't mean that like Canada or any other uh, country that's not listed as its local geographies won't be considered. We definitely will be considering them, and uh, you know, we'll definitely be getting uh, ambassadors from outside those local geographies. Okay. And there was a question about how to set up an account uh, in the repository uh, site. Um, like someone said they went there, but didn't immediately see how to set up an account. Could you just go back there and yeah. show that? Um, let me pop back here. All right, so let me log out of my account here. Okay, so uh, if you're on the Markive repository, uh, you can just go to sign up right here in the top right. And then doing that, all you have to do is just put in your name, your email address, and make a password, and then just show that you're not a robot. Um, you can also log in through your institution. There's a whole bunch of different institutions that already have uh, partnerships with the OSF. So if you're at Boston University, Brown, Florida State, uh, any of these other providers, you can log in directly through that as well, which is really handy. Um, so let's just say I'm I, you know, not in one of those. I go back to create account. Anyway, so yeah, if you just put in this information here, and then you can log in. Uh, you can also uh, link your Twitter, Facebook, um, ORC ID, um, I think your ResearchGate profiles, academia.edu profiles, all that kind of stuff into your OSF account too. Uh, this will help make sure that people uh, know all the different places they can look to find your research. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick. Um, there was a question. Can you say more about the podcasts? When will you start producing them and what will they focus on? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so we're kind of, uh, so we're treating these um, basically as kind of like a uh, podcast version of um, kind of like a, a Oh man, what's the word I'm going for here? Kind of like a, an academic paper club. So kind of like a book club, but for academic research. So we're going to be talking about the research that we're reading and summarizing from archive. Um, so basically it'll just be a group of us uh, talking about the research we've been reading and sharing some of the lessons learned and best practices of that research and inviting authors to come and talk about their research as well. Uh, so we can expand upon the research that they're talking about. Um, we expect most of the research that we're summarizing will come in preprint and postprint form from traditional peer-reviewed academic publications, which, as we all know, academic writing does not lend itself to very much creativity <laughs> or uh, very much uh, descriptive um, writing styles, if you will. So we hope that the podcast will allow um, authors to be able to share more information um, about their research than like they would otherwise be writing about in a traditional peer review publication. Um, as far as when they're officially come out, uh, right now <laughs> we're just looking at sometime in the early part of the new year. Uh, so my hope is that we'll get started on these all in January and we'll obviously keep everybody informed uh, from the, the Markive website and the Markive Twitter and, and Open Octo Twitter as well uh, once we get that going. Okay. Um, and is there any way to find out what just the latest papers are that have been uploaded to Markive? Is there any way to search and just, you know, if you come back once a month or something, you can just see what's been added since then? Yes. Since your last visit? Yeah. So that you can do. Um, so I'm just going to go back here. So if you just go to the search. Uh, so these are default sorted by relevance, but you can also sort by date, oldest to newest, or newest to oldest. So I'm just going to go by newest to oldest, and you can see that these are the latest papers that we've had. Um, again, there's only five in here right now because we have we, we're just officially launching now, so <laughs> we got some early papers in there. But um, soon that'll be handy a way to keep track of it. Oh, okay, great. Um, and there was a question. Uh, or a comment question. Uh, this is a good repository and is highly needed by people from developing countries like those in Africa. Uh, so why isn't there an African ambassador on the board? Uh, we haven't reached out to anybody in Africa yet. Um, so we have reached out to a number of different researchers um, from the focal geographies for Packard. And unfortunately, no nations in Africa were part of the focal geographies for Packard, so we didn't specifically reach out to anybody from there. Um, we are still working on expanding the OS or the, the uh, 
sorry, the Markive um, Advisory Board. Uh, so we're by no means done building out the advisory board. Uh, we've literally just been getting the advisory board together in the last several weeks. Um, the project just started officially October 1st, so we haven't had too long to reach out to that many people officially. Um, but if you have suggestions for who would be a good fit, please email me, uh, just nick at octogroup.org. Uh, we'd love to have more representation on the advisory board. Okay, great. Thank you. And if anyone has any, any additional questions, go ahead and send them in now. Um, let's see. And I, do you have any sort of goals for a number of papers you are, are want to get on the site or any sort of numbers per month or anything? Uh, yes and no. Um, so I guess my like, you know, internal goal is that we would like to see somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 papers a week um, out of the archive. Uh, so for open channels, where many of you might be familiar with us, uh, we do the literature update newsletters for that um, and that's focusing on mostly ocean conservation research. Uh, we also do some climate change too, but mostly ocean conservation related. And there we see on average about 30 to 40 academic papers published a week that we're finding out about. Um, and those are mostly peer reviewed academic publications, but occasionally reports and things like that too. Uh, so we know the volume of research that we're looking at um, is definitely greater than 30 to 40. You know, it's probably like double that that's actually published that's relevant. That's just the part that we find out about. So we'd like to see the volume stick to about what we're sharing in open channels, uh, just because you know that is probably equal to about half of the research that's being published that's relevant to our work. So you know, I think I think having a, a goal of getting half of the research in there to begin with is is a pretty good goal, and we'll see if we can meet that. Yeah, great. I mean, yeah, it's going to require a culture shift just uh, in terms of how people think about publishing, but th that'll be great. So uh, let's see. Oh, and there are some more questions. Um, uh, I was curious about being able to save uh, your searches or references as you browse through the papers. Is this sort of tool available? Huh. You know, I don't know. I don't think you can save searches, but... I believe if you type in, um, so let's just say I want to look for stakeholder engagement. Um, so the search terms do get saved in the URL. So if you want to like keep track of like different things you've been searching for, you could just make a list of the different uh, query terms in the URL uh, and just reference back to those. Um, I know that uh, the Markhive repository is all accessible via RSS as well. Uh, we don't have documentation for that online yet, uh, but that'll be coming on very shortly. Um, so you can also very well likely just automatically set up queries to go through as brand new papers are added from the RSS. And again, and we'll have more documentation on that shortly. Okay. Um, and what would be the rule around being a second or third author on a paper and uploading it? I expect there would need to be agreement between all authors on the paper. That's question. Um, yeah, I mean, just like with you know any kind of manuscript that people are writing, you know that is all usually determined before you get to the uh, publication phase. Um, so for for Markive itself, um, we are just you know we're asking for the publication or the authorship information based on the publication. So whoever, you know, whatever order you have authors listed on on that publication is what, you know, should be uh, referenced in Markhive. Uh, and again, you can add other people to the project without citing them. So if there are, you know, uh, research associates and assistants that are like helping do that research that wouldn't normally be cited as actually writing the academic paper, you can still give them access to the document. Uh, to have read and write access to it if you'd like. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick. Um, we don't have any other questions right now. Um, is there anything else you wanted to leave people with? Any last bits uh, of information? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, if you have any questions, please email me. Uh, let me put my email address back up on the screen again real quick. Um, do, 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 do. Here we go. Uh, -da. Yeah, so if you have any questions, just email me at nick at octogroup.org. Um, 
Again, most things uh, have been documented on the markhive.org website. Uh, so, you know, for specific uh, walkthroughs, again, on how to actually upload all this stuff and whatnot, uh, and a lot of the policies for uh, the default policies, I should say, for publishers are all listed there. Um, and again, just follow Markhive Papers on Twitter for updates as everything we go along. Uh, if you're not already a subscriber to the Open Channels Literature Update, uh, that's a really good way to stay abreast of all the uh, new academic research that's going on in ocean conservation. And that's just at openchannels.org. Uh, you can sign up for the literature update uh, if you make a user account there. Um, but with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today and uh, you know, for being willing to hear about preprints and, and open science for ocean conservation. We'd love to have your research. Uh, you know, it's really easy to upload it. Uh, you know, and anything you want to share, I'm sure we'd be interested in seeing it. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at all kinds of academic outputs for uh, ocean conservation research because, you know, just basically there's so much research out there that needs to be shared with people that need it. So, okay. thank you. Well, Nick, thank you for driving this and just uh, being such a, a force in this area and creating such a, a valuable tool for the field. So, and we're glad you were able to be on today to, to share it. Okay, and thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. And again, uh, Nick's very responsive, so I, it, I would highly recommend if you have additional questions, getting in touch with Nick at the Nick at Octogroup.org. Okay, well, thanks everyone for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars and seeing your papers and uh, in archive. Okay, bye everyone.